Assistant Kevin Petroff talked about some of the common trends that we're seeing not only in our in our schools but in the district and what procedures that they have in place. Uh, and I think Kevin's going to talk a little bit about um, the juvenile justice system and how it's designed to rehabilitate kids because we think that that's important. Um, we don't want anybody to think that you know uh, there are no second chances. There's always second chances in life. I don't care if you're a kid or if you're an adult. Um, so we, we would like Kevin to talk a little bit about the, the rehabilitation process of the juvenile justice system and, and why it's designed to rehabilitate kids. Everybody's entitled to make bad decisions. And so we just encourage our kids that if you, can, you, know, if you make a bad decision, it's okay. Uh, we can recover from that and we can move forward. So um, we wanted you guys here tonight as parents just to talk to you. Uh, about some of the things that we're doing. Uh, one of the things that we're doing here is uh, we've implemented a system uh, that's, that's nationally known. Uh, there's 1,400 participating agencies in this system. It's called Mutual Link. It works off of the RAVE app. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Maybe some of you have not heard of it. Um, but basically what it is, is this is a means for our staff to communicate immediately to our law enforcement partners and we've placed this app in the hands of every one of our teachers and every one of our staff members. It looks like this. Um, if I were to push this button right now, it would immediately notify uh, four of our local participating law enforcement uh, uh, agencies, one being DPS, happy to have them here tonight. Uh, Mr. Paul Atkins, Captain, correct? Yeah. Lieutenant, okay, Lieutenant Paul Atkins with DPS. Um, Texas City PD, Lamarck PD, and um, Galveston County Sheriff's Department who uh, provide uh, our SLOs for our district. Um, so the way that's designed is that's, that's placed in the hands of every teacher and every staff member. If there's an active shooting, if there's a classroom disruption, if there's a medical emergency, there's a button for that. And what we've done is we've built out the communications for each one of those functions to notify the right people. And for example, when the active shooter button is pushed, it immediately notifies dispatch without a phone call. We've installed a, a terminal in each one of the dispatch uh, centers for all of our local law enforcement. That then um, initiates the incident. The dispatcher opens up that incident. What that does is that phone, let's say that I push that button with my phone, right? This is the phone that was used. I can drop that, I can prop it up. Um, what it does is that phone now becomes an audio device and the dispatcher can hear and see everything in that incident. So there's no need for our, our law enforcement partners to even communicate over the radio, um, you know, what it is, you know, white male shooter, uh, AK-47, black trench coat, blue, blue ball cap, they can see it because once the button's pushed, it's integrated into our computer, into our camera systems, and then they can now control our camera systems and see into our schools. So what it does is it cuts down response, police response, by 50%. So, um, perfect example, Friday we had our first false alarm with that. Um, teacher accidentally pushed the button, that's our first one. Uh, we expected that. Um, within uh, under a minute, we had eight officers at Levi Fry on Friday. With it under a minute, eight. Um, I had Lieutenant Atkins calling me from Austin because he's he signed up for the system. He got notification and he was sending units from Austin, uh, from the local area, of course. But um, So the system does work. The other thing that, uh, that we have is we've uh, rolled out these first net phones. We're the first school district in the state of Texas to have preemption and priority first responder status through uh, the federal government to recognize us as a first responder. Basically what this phone does is this gives us preemption and priority, meaning that in the event of an emergency, everybody's on the network, 
networks gets clogged, phone calls can't get out, text messages can't get out. What it does is because we have that preemption and priority status, it allows our communications to go through. It pushes everybody else off the bat, so our communications will work. But the beauty of that is this is linked with mutual link. And so in the officer's cars and on their handhelds, we've installed a modem and we give them access that when the first responder, let's say that it's the, let's say we have an incident at Lamar High School. Lamar High School happens, <laughs> issue happens there. That SLO responds, he goes in that classroom or she goes in that classroom, they push a button on this phone. This phone now becomes a live streaming device and it's broadcast out to all the responding officers. So the responding officers can now see and hear what that officer is seeing. So we'll move on to the next slide. And I will do that. Second thing that we've rolled out is uh, Wade Garcia. Everybody knows about these, I believe, is our, our badges that we've rolled out this year. What this does is it works off of radio frequency and it tells me uh, what zone your kid is in. I, I will know exactly where your child is at inside the school for evacuation purposes. When we rolled these out, there was some, some questions of, you know, uh, are we spying on your child? Uh, a whole bunch of talk was going on. That's not, that's not what we're doing this for. What we're doing this for is that I think anybody that was involved in not only Santa Fe shooting, but Parkland, there was actually a shooting this morning in North Carolina. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is give the parent a little bit of peace of mind that we know where your kid is at. We've installed this system on almost 70 of our buses. And so what it does is it gives us a glimpse inside of that incident of where our children are, where our students are, so that if, we have an incident in the northwest corner of the building and we've got a shooter contained. We can now send assets to the southeast corner and start drawing those children out of that building and evacuating them. Once they get on the bus, hands free, uh, the badge is detected. It tells me what kid is on what bus and what reunification site they're going to. We have a couple reunification sites in town that have agreed to let us install the system there so that once they arrive, let's say that's this auditorium, we'll know who's in here. I can tell you within 28 seconds where your child is at. That's the purpose of these badges. Nothing more, nothing less. That's it. So we'll go into the next one. Um, when we got here, when I first got here, one of the first things that I, th I said we need to do is train our entire staff on, on threat assessment. Being a former Secret Service agent and having investigated threats towards the President of the United States, I think this is key. I think research backs what we're saying, uh, or, or the statistics prove that if we know about a, an event prior to it happening, uh, then we can, we can stop it. I, I do a presentation periodically. Uh, it's called Prior Knowledge. It's based upon a National Threat Assessment Center. Um, publication in 2008, it, it studied all the shootings from 2000 to 2008, and in 93% of those cases, um, they have stated that if we had someone, and there's always someone, 93% of the time, uh, that knows about someone who's volatile, that has these emotions or these thoughts of mass shootings or mass, uh, you, know, uh, you know, violence. And so um, I think that's where we win this fight is we prepare our students, our staff, to see something, say something, know the uh, pre-attack indicators, and um, have their, their appropriate resources to, to uh, help, it should help those students out. So what we did was we contracted with Sigma Threat Assessment Training. Uh, it's comprised of um, former National Threat Assessment Center employees, Dr. Marissa Randazzo and my former uh, boss at the Houston field office, the Secret Service, uh, Cindy Marble, and they have a, a program that they uh, push out. It has 11 steps to threat assessment, what the guidelines are, and so with that information, uh, we trained our entire staff on threat assessment. That happened in August. After that, what we did was um, we established threat assessment teams on every single campus. It's a multidisciplinary team made up from the principal down to uh, 
a brand new janitor that's on campus. And they follow the guidelines of Sigma and the National Threat Assessment Center put out by the Secret Service. And they assess threats and they assess um, you know, pre-attack indicators and warnings to see if someone is the harm to themselves or someone else. Another way that we uh, are using the Sigma Threat Assessment is we have a, an app called P3 Campus. And through P3 Campus, our students can report and it goes straight to the threat assessment teams on campus so that they're getting the, uh, the information uh, directly so that there's no need to go through a bunch of hoops and it's more streamlined. So that's that. Um, the other issue or, that I saw when I got here is, you know, who's trained in medical staff like, or, or in, in medical, um, you know, procedures? Is, does anybody know how to stop leads other than the nurse? You know, most shootings, um, people could have, you know, people, person's life could have been saved uh, if they had just stopped bleeding. And so we teamed up with the University of the Texas Medical Branch in Galveston and Texas City Fire, and they brought down a staff of 25. We used this auditorium during convocation, and our entire staff, all 1,400, went through the training, and uh, they have now been instructed on how to stop bleeding. We also issued each one of them a tourniquet. We advise them to keep them with them. Keep it in your purse, keep it in your pocket. You never know when that next incident's gonna happen. So uh, we did that. I don't think there's any other school districts that's, that's trained their entire staff on stop the bleed. But uh, we did that to stop the bleed. Okay, social sentinel is one of the things that was controversial. Uh, people don't like the idea of someone spying on their kids. I can tell you that's not what we're doing. Like I said earlier in that 2008 report by the National Threat Assessment Center, statistics have shown in 93% of the cases if we know about something prior to it happening and we can encourage people who know about it um, to step forward, then we can, we can nine times out of 10 stop that. So in order to do that, we have to have the right tools, okay? Social Sentinel is a tool for us. What it does is there's a 450,000 word library of harm that they use. Um, they take into, into context what's being said on social media platforms. Um, and these are all public profiles. We're not spying on anybody's private uh, profiles. This is all on, on public uh, social media sites. For example, if I say, you know, Mr. Nathan Jackson, is the bomb, they will take, and he is the bomb, by the way, but uh, if they, if I, if I say that, they will take that in the context that that's just me giving him a compliment. Now, if I say, I'm going to give Mr. Jackson a bomb to blow up Texas City ISD, then obviously we'll get flagged on that. So we get a daily report, and then from there, we go in and we check every single one. We have a team uh, that does that, uh, we've hired our own technical security officer who's very skilled at this, former military guy in intelligence, uh, in the intelligence field. And uh, between him and I and the rest of our team, uh, we vet that. So that's Social Sentinel in a nutshell. Uh, and keep in mind, we're gonna open this up to questions. If anybody has any questions after the presentation, I'm just kind of running through these slides just to give you a little bit of a taste of what we've got going on. And also keep in mind, there's a lot of other things that we're doing. These are just the major things that we're doing. Um, so, um, just a couple other security measures that we have in place. Uh, we purchased 14 gun safes for our SLOs, uh, one for each campus. Uh, we will have 16 campuses in the next two years when we build the, the, the new four schools that we're building through a bond. And thank you as citizens for passing that bond. We really appreciate it because had that bond not been passed, we wouldn't have been able to do the things that we're doing. Um, we've established a central mail receiving facility. Um, so all packages go to a central uh, uh, location where they're swept. We're working with our local partners and law enforcement um, to sweep those, those packages for explosives. So all packages will go to uh, the mail facility. Uh, that, that started on October the 8th. Uh, we did a joint training exercise with Galveston County Sheriff's Office, Tech City PD, Lamar PD, Tech City, and Lamar Fire. EMS Precinct 3 Constable's Office. That was on August the 7th. I will tell you that I could not be happier with the response we had. Uh, not just from anybody in particular, but I will say 
Um, the SLOs that we have in our, in our schools, I was very happy with their performance uh, during that, that uh, exercise. It went very well. In the, in the spring, uh, what we're trying to do, we're working with Texas City Office of Emergency Management to put together a larger scale training, uh, working with their Director of, uh, Office of Emergency Management, Tom Munoz, and we will be then pulling in other assets like Texas Department of Public Safety. They bring a tremendous amount of, as of assets and resources as well as skill. That we will be bringing them in in the, in the spring. Uh, we will be doing hopefully tabletops between now and then, but the largest, the large exercise will more than likely be over spring break. Um, we've hired eight additional Galveston County uh, SLOs for our campuses, uh, all on the elementary campuses. Uh, we have one deputy uh, at least on, on all the elementary campuses and on secondary campuses have at least two. We also have this year our very first uh, canine dog, or canine officer. Uh, we brought over uh, one of Texas City PD's finest and um, not only her but her dog as well. And we're looking to have a second dog in the coming months, maybe within the next year, hopefully. Um, in addition, we've added a, a sergeant, which I'll talk about. We'll, you'll get a chance to hear him here in a minute talk about the SLO's duties on campuses. It's uh, Sergeant John Hamm with the Galveston County Sheriff's Office. And um, we have a new lieutenant. And then, like I said, we'll continue to use P3 as our means of, of gathering information. So things to come, um, this is just a small scale of what we've got. Uh, each school will have their own unique response plan. Uh, and I've said this since day one. Uh, my background as a former Secret Service agent, counter assault team operator, and presidential protective uh, division agent, I will not give this district anything less than I gave the President of the United States. So our response plan, you'll be able to pick it up, look at it, and it'll look just the same as the President's. I will give it that, that much attention to detail because we all know that after any incident, the first thing that everybody says is, well, you know, uh, great, we had a great response, but nobody knew what they, you know, nobody knew what anybody else was doing or what we should do. You know, we're just kind of winging it. So our goal is with this response plan is that all of our participating agencies will have the plan in place. They will know where they're supposed to go. They won't need direction. So, um, that will include emergency landing zones, reunification sites, command posts, designated media areas, and establishment of an incident command structure, which is vital to communication. You can have the best trained people in the world, but if they don't know how to communicate, then you've got nothing. So um, we'll designate primary and secondary responders based upon a 12 minute response time. Meaning if you can't get there in 12 minutes, you will not be a primary uh, responder. And so each one will have their own unique, each campus will have their own unique response plan. We'll have a counter surveillance survey that tells us what are our vulnerabilities from the outside looking in. I will do that myself. We're currently starting the process on that. Each one will have a physical security assessment. Uh, we have already done the assessment and I'm waiting for the quote right now as we speak. Each campus will have a uh, hardened uh, vestibule as you enter. It will be a controlled access vestibule. In those vestibules, we will have push button entry and exits. We will have shatter proof and bullet resistant glass um, so that someone, even if they don't have a, a rifle or a pistol, they say they bring in a baseball bat and start banging on windows. I can show you some videos of some products we're gonna put in place where even though you've got a baseball bat, you're not getting through that window. You'll be out of breath before you penetrate that window. So um, this is something that we just passed last week. Um, upgraded camera systems, facial recognition, artificial intelligence, geofencing of our assets, for example, like our maintenance facility, our buses, uh, unusual motion detection, and night vision. Uh, we decided to go with a Panasonic product. Uh, we are using a company uh, called KLC and Faircom, and um, they will be installing that over the Thanksgiving break. Uh, we have upgraded our camera systems uh, from around 800 cameras to where we'll have about 1,500 cameras uh, when it's all said and done. And uh, the capabilities of these cameras are first, are first class. So um, I talked about the staff security committee, the six-person uh, campus uh, 
threat assessment teams, those are in place. We're refining those a little bit. We're not quite there yet, but they are actively assessing threats. Um, we're still refining those. In the future, what I'd like to see is uh, student security committees. I think these are important. We've got to get the kids involved and let them know that there are avenues for them to uh, relay information to us, not only through the P3 Campus app. You know, a lot of the things we get from, from kids now is just them coming and reporting to an administrator. And then uh, we, we already have started the random canine sweep with the dog and uh, random handheld magnetometer screenings at sporting events. This is something that I'd like to see. Will we see, that th see this this year? Probably not. I'm hoping that in the next year we'll see that. Uh, it just requires training. So, all right, and I think this is the last slide. Talk about new lockdown procedures. Um, this, is a, this is a hot topic. Um, you know, what do you do? Do you run high fight? Yeah, I think you could kind of do all of that. You know, I'd say you just do what nature tells you to do in protecting yourself. If it means picking up a chair and throwing it at somebody, do that. If it means you have to wait on that shooter's um, magazine exchange to know what that sounds like and then run, then do that. But if you can't do that, what we're going to do is we're going to teach our teachers and give them the tools they need to protect themselves and our students, because that's number one. So. We looked at a couple different barricade devices. We sent out a request for bid, and we had several different companies bid on that. Uh, we are purchasing 1,500 barricade devices to go in all of our classrooms. Um, this product here, I believe, is the best because it allows our law enforcement personnel and officers to access the door from the exterior, where a lot of the other ones do not. So, you know, that's the thing is a lot of people send in bids and you know, it's my job to assess these products. Okay, great, your product works. How do my law enforcement officers get in to save everybody? This product allows that. So uh, one of the things that we'll be doing in conjunction with this is installing that 3M shatterproof and ballistic resistant film on the classroom doors. So where you see the placement of this product, it, it won't be there. We'll be mitigating it in other ways. So, okay. That's a teacher lock in a nutshell. Like I said, um, there's a bunch of different products. I believe that's the best one. I believe that in the event of an emergency, if you've never been under that amount of stress, your body does some really weird things. You lose dexterity in your hands and your fine motor skills go out the window. So the red button on this side of the door allows anybody to disengage the lock. The teacher is the only one who will have the key. It's a proprietary key, it's patented. I won't show you that up close. Um, the other thing I will show you is the law enforcement key that we will be issuing to our law enforcement officers uh, that they use to open the key from the exterior. One of the other quick things that we're going to do uh, is uh, I believe that uh, in this day and age, like I said, we had a shooting this morning in North Carolina and we pray for the, those people there. Um, this day and age, we have to do everything we can to empower our teachers so that they can do what's within within their ability to protect themselves and their students. So uh, we will be installing access controls on all classroom doors. It is not practical for me to think that I can have a teacher fumble through 15 keys on her, or his or her keychain, open up their classroom door to seek refuge if someone's shooting at them or attacking them. So we will be installing uh, access controls on all classroom doors within the coming months. Probably that project will start in January. We want to make sure we have the best product. So that in conjunction with the teacher lock, I think we're headed in the right direction. Like I said, we'll, I'll be here, um, uh, Kevin Petroff with the DA's office and Chief uh, uh, Sergeant Ham will be here to uh, answer any questions after this. So let me go ahead and invite Kevin Petroff up to speak on most popular topic that's terroristic threats and in other things thank you thank you for being here tonight thank you for having me um, from the district attorney's office the question that we most get at these types of meetings of is what are we doing differently since Santa Fe and, and there are a couple things that we want to talk about before we get too far into the law the first is we are simply working with 
um, school district and police at schools far more thoroughly than we had previously. Um, typically, our crimes are divided between felonies and misdemeanors. Misdemeanors are less serious. You can still go to jail for up to a year. Felonies are where people go to prison. And normally, when an officer arrests on a misdemeanor, they don't have to have communication with our office. They just make the arrest and we review it later to see if the case meets all the requirements for a criminal charge. Whereas in felony, we would work with the officer before the person is arrested to determine, do we have a case? Is there more investigation that needs to be done? What type of charge fits this? I can tell you that since Santa Fe, we are working with school districts and school police officers on both misdemeanors and felonies very thoroughly to determine, is this a case where we need to charge? What is the appropriate charge? And what evidence do we have or need to obtain to, to make that charge stick? The other thing that we're doing differently is either myself or our elected district attorney, Jack Rohde, is being personally involved in each case. Now that can mean either we get notice of the case when a prosecutor accepts a charge, or uh, if there's a disagreement between the officer and the prosecutor, then we're brought in to, to work with the officer and see what we have. But really, the, the big thing that we are doing differently is that we are very much erring on the side of caution. Since Santa Fe, if we feel that we have a fact scenario in which a person can be charged, that all the requirements of a criminal charge are met, we are erring on the side of charging. Now, <laughs> we get one of two complaints frequently. Either we're not charging enough people in schools or we are charging too many people. And it's sort of a difficult thing to navigate through. Our thinking is this. On juvenile system, it's a lot different than the adult criminal system. And when we have a student making a threat, we don't know much at that point. We know they've made a threat, but we don't really know much about the student. The school may, but we don't. Um, and the juvenile system is different in that we work alongside defense attorneys, alongside a juvenile probation department, alongside even a judge to figure out what best merits, what this juvenile and what the case best merits in terms of an outcome. And so the thinking is that if we err on the side of charging where legally we can, um, then we get a better picture of does this student really uh, represent a real threat? And if so, what are the best options for us to deal with that threat, to take it out of the schools? You know, again, another way that the juvenile system is different is that there is a protection for that juvenile. If that individual doesn't commit other crimes, uh, is it designated uh, a, a violent felon, the case isn't transferred to adult court, then there is uh, an automatic both sealing and restricting of that juvenile file so it doesn't haunt them forever. And so this is the system that we started leaning on. And again, sometimes we get complaints. Sometimes we end up with someone who just, a, a juvenile that knew that there were magic words that could be said that would provoke adults. And, and as we learn that, as we feel safer, we not, may not proceed in that juvenile or we may proceed differently as we learn more about them. Now, those are the cases that we do take. The other complaint we sometimes hear is that we're not charging enough. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what the law requires of us to even accept a charge. And my put up terroristic threat, which is typically the charge that we are dealing with when a student makes a threat at school or about school. Basically, the three factors, terroristic threat involves a lot of different types of behavior, as you can kind of see from this. But A, one, two, and five are the ones that we're primarily looking at. If a person makes a threat, if I say I'm gonna come and beat you up, well, that can be a terroristic threat if the state can prove that I intended to cause some fear on you that you're gonna beat you up. And that that threat is imminent, meaning it's immediate. It's gonna happen very quickly. And 
That is a misdemeanor. That is what we see when we get A2. Uh, That's typically when people are just threatening each other what we're looking at. The other type is to cause a reaction to a threat by an official organized or designed to deal with emergencies. So some school threats could fall into that. Uh, again, the intent still has to be that they are causing fear, causing a reaction by those uh, emergency personnel. Those are both misdemeanor offenses. Class B, the lowest level other than you know, the traffic ticket level that you can get. What we're generally dealing with when a student makes a threat to say blow up or shoot up a school is A5, which is placing the public or a substantial group of the public in fear of serious bodily injury. And that is what we're working on. Um, some of the things that don't quite raise, rise to that level are personal communications. We had a case recently where two students were texting each other. Because we couldn't show that this was intended to place the public in fear, we couldn't necessarily make that case because that was a private communication. But when a student stands up in a classroom or on a bus or, or anywhere and makes a threat, well then the presumption is going to be that it's going to cause a reaction. Social media is, is similar in that way. If, if they make a post, a public post on social media, there is going to be a thought that this is designed to cause a reaction by the public. So those are some of the things that we're looking for. Those are some of the changes that, that we've adopted since Santa Fe to, again, err on the side of safety for students, for teachers, for everyone in school, and still provide justice as best as the system allows. Uh, I think, as Mike pointed out, we're going to take some questions at the end of this, which I'm happy to do. Um, at this point, I'll turn it back over to Mike. Okay. So we'll go to um, our next slide, and uh, we're going to talk about school climate. And um, I believe that we have some of the best SLOs in the business. I'm not just saying that. We have a wealth of knowledge in our SLO ranks um, provided through the Galveston County Sheriff's Office. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Sergeant John Tam, he's going to talk a little bit about the, the roles and the functions of the SLOs on campus, and he will be available for question uh, questions also afterwards. So, Mr. John Tam. Thank you, sir. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Sounds good. Hadn't heard much from the crowd. I know it's late in the day. My name's John Ham. I'm a sergeant with the Galveston County Sheriff's Office. I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Sheriff Henry Crossesette, uh, the Texas City Independent School District, Dr. Kappas, Mr. Matranga, and the board, uh, the 19 deputies that we have in the district, and I'd like to further that to go on to say I want to thank you educators. I've been on the school district campus for the last two and a half months in training, and through that, I've seen something that has really opened my eyes. You're looking at 29 years of law enforcement within the Houston and Galveston area. Anyway, from a jailer all the way through administration and chief of police. And I can tell you that there's not a more rewarding position to have than to serve on one of your campuses. And what better time of great of need than 2018? Look what we're going through together. Uh, you teachers, give yourself a round of applause. I know you're out there. Having said that, how about now? Good deal. I'd like to show a few slides to you. Talking about the school climate, uh, see something and say something. We're asking all students and all adults to report any suspicious behavior or activity both at the school and online, okay? That's, that's having a good neighbor. That's having a friend in the district. That's having someone that you feel like you can talk to. And these campus officers that are out there, 
I can tell you we have, just in this district alone, well, our, I'm sorry, back up a little further, we have a captain in, in Lake City. We have a lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Brent Cooley, he's not with us this evening. Uh, he's housed at our administration building. We have three district supervisors. I happen to be one. Uh, I serve as a supervisor of the elementary schools. Uh, in addition to that, Levi Fry. Uh, we also have Sergeant Salcedo in the Lamarck District and Derek Fillmore at the high school, blocker, and the DA meeting. Uh, we have 19 deputies. We have two on each high school, two on each intermediate, and one on each elementary. And we've been training now and trying to catch up with all the things that we have to do uh, with our training and get used to this, this new school year. Uh, and through that, what better relationship can you have if you have a police officer that you feel you're comfortable with, that you see every day, that you can talk to and speak with, and you know by their first name. My first name's John. Anybody that wants to call me that, after this, you're welcome. I prefer you do that. Sergeant will always work, but uh, the bully reporting. Students can report face-to-face -face online through P3 campus. Student assemblies regarding school safety to include information on behavioral expectations and possible consequences. Okay, one of the things that I've learned since I've been here uh, that's taken me back just a little bit, I want to get a little more intimate with you guys for just a moment. Imagine what you would think or imagine what you would say if you heard this. Uh, my campus principal and assistant principal asked me to weigh in on a subject one day and as Police officers in Galveston County Sheriff's deputies in schools, we play a role, but it's not a disciplinary role. Okay, this is not something that we can tell the student you put their nose in the corner or you're getting 10 day suspension. Uh, the counseling role could, could be either taken in a gray area or mis misinterpreted by a parent or someone with the district. There's always a loose ends that could apply. We are here on campus to do the law enforcement related duties. Anything regarding the law enforcement role, that's the job of the Sheriff's Office. We're guided by policy through the Texas City Independent School District. Uh, and with that, we have a partnership uh, that I can recognize and tell you that I'm very glad to be a part of. This is a, a very good organization and Texas City has taken a lot of steps to ensure your children's safety out here. I can tell you from boots on the ground, if you come by one of the schools, I'll be glad to show you and talk with you about it. Uh, the incident that I'm going to refer to, I'm going to give you right quick because I know we all want to get to some questions. Uh, there's no way in the world I can speak until midnight and be able to answer all of them. Was I, I, my Spanish is it's not bad, but it wasn't good enough to be able to uh, speak as fluent as I needed to. So I did this through an interpreter. But the subject matter was, we had a, a young man or a child. He was this big. You can imagine on an elementary school campus. And he had dug his heels in and decided that he was not going to behave. And this isn't a common occurrence. It, it, it happens daily, I'm told. And I was asked to come down and assist. Uh, the principal and the assistant principal uh, explained the mom and the dad's role and what they had discussed with them. And we're just about to the point of saying, dad has to come sit with his son or he has to pick his son up, take him home. We just don't know what else to do. Now with that, uh, through the interpreter, I spoke with the dad. What I heard took me back so far, it took me a few minutes to try to figure out uh, where in this society we went wrong, okay? Law enforcement can't, can't cure those evils. We only get the 911 call after. This dad told us, he said, the school is not doing enough to discipline my child while he's here during the day, and therefore the child acts out when he gets home at night. So it's the school's fault and responsibility for the way my child acts. Now you as a parent, you as an employee of this district, you're probably gonna need five minutes to yourself when you get home at night to think about that. I know I did. And as diplomatically and politely as I could, using every tool that my grandmother taught me uh, as a gentleman to be able to say there's no law enforcement official, there's no school board member, there's no teacher, educator, 
There's no anyone in position authority in this district that should be able to run your home. You're going to need to do that on your own. And your child is expected to behave. We have 600 students where I am at Heights Elementary on 25th Street. And through that, I'm responsible for the safety of all of those students and staff and the building. And while we're concentrating on just him for the next few minutes, look at the amount of manpower that it took to do that. We had four administrators in there with me. And we're trying to teach dad how to take control of his son. And my words were, if you don't do it when he's this tall, how are you going to do it when he's this tall? Okay. See something, say something. I just wanted to put that out there for you teachers because I'm closer to you now. I used to think, well, the teachers probably need a Kevlar vest, like the stop and go clerks, as well as the police. But now I can see how intimate that you are with these children and what you're doing for us. Uh, I can tell you that we have good relationships with our staff here. I know that it's going to be even better. We've got some deputies that are jumping around on different campuses. They're in training, and you've met and seen quite a few of us. Uh, you're going to meet a few more because we've got some more that are going to be hired soon. Uh, we have excellent relationships uh, through the district. Uh, district attorney's office, I could go all the way down the list. Okay. And again, my first name is John. I enjoyed speaking with you, and I'd like to answer questions uh, after the fact, and I'll get out of your way. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> Thank you guys. Uh, really blessed to have uh, such a good staff with the uh, SLOs here and, and uh, Sergeant Ham, he brings a lot to the table as well as all of our, our deputies. But uh, we'll go down to the next slide. So we'll talk about school climate. So these are some of the things that uh, we recognize and they kind of tie in with our threat assessment and the need for mental health. Um, we have one of the best in the business, Ms. Donna Peterson. I think she's back in the back. Um, we have many conversations on social norms and what's going on with our kids and why we're seeing the behaviors that we're seeing. And uh, we see the need that uh, instead of putting kids in jail, which we don't really, we try not to do that. Sometimes there's nothing we can do. Uh, we feel the need that uh, we need to have adequate resources on the mental health side. You know, there's something going on there and I've said since day one I believe this is a social change uh, it's a societal change where um, people feel really comfortable putting things on social media that they wouldn't normally say uh, in person and uh, they don't realize the repercussions and so that's why we wanted to talk to you guys as parents tonight is we want to encourage you to have that dialogue with your with your children that you, know, you just can't say some of these things that you're thinking. And if you're thinking some of these things, then there's resources for you. And so uh, I would like to say thank you to our Deputy Su Superintendent, uh, Susan Myers, for reaching out to some of these um, uh, resources that we have, and, as well as Donna. And so uh, one of the things that we have here is our social and emotional learning is Sweet 360 and Ripple, uh, Ripple Effects. So Ripple Effects is a web-based program which addresses social and emotional learning topics such as bullying, conflict resolution, and learning to control responses to emotions. The program will be implemented on all elementary campuses during the computer lab rotation. Um, Sweet 360 is a web and app-based program which allows, or I'm sorry, which also addresses social emotional learning topics re relevant to the middle and high school students, uh, grades five through 12. So this will be Levi Fry and up for Texas City. Uh, this program will be implemented on all uh, five through 12 campuses during the instructional day. Parents also can access uh, a wide variety of parent resources on topics related to social and emotional needs in the fear, or I'm sorry, in the near future, parents of five through 12 grade students will be receiving an email inviting them to log on to the site for access to parent information related to topics covered with students. And um, I think that, that equally as important, important as having SLOs on campus, we have to have these programs. If it were up to me, I would have a clinical psychologist on every single campus, but that requires funds. So um, we're doing the absolute best that we can. So with our mental health support, the district's working to increase our mental health support for students by reaching out to and partnering with local agencies, uh, Resolve It is new the, this year. We just finished a contract uh, uh, 
Ms. Myers has been working on that for quite some time, and we were able to secure that. We're really excited about having them. Resolve It uh, has been servicing students in Texas City ISD for seven years. Uh, we're working in partnership with them to expand services to all campuses, uh, allowing more students to receive direct intervention. And the Teen Health Clinic, I think this is one of the best assets that we have. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is Teen Health Clinic is a 501c3. They work off of proceeds. We have a clinic in Texas City. We have a clinic in Lamarck. And um, we, don't, we don't control them at all. Um, they, like I said, they work solely off of donations. And they've been servicing our schools for, and our communities for a long time. The unfortunate part is, because of funding, we are losing the Teen Health Clinic in Lamarck. So if anyone knows uh, anyone that would like to contribute it to the Teen Health Clinic, and uh, uh, you know, we really would love to keep them on our campus, and they, they are an invaluable asset, and it's terrible that we're going to lose them. So, but we will still have the, the clinic in Texas City. And uh, lastly, but not least, uh, MHMR, they provide a full range of services to our students and our community. I believe that if anybody has any questions for any of these, uh, Resolve It, Teen Health, and MHMR, there should be a representative here tonight if you'd like to speak with them about how they can help you or your family. So let's start real quick, and then we'll, we, can, we can, you can interject with questions as we go. So student expectations, uh, you know, we always say, if you see something, say something. I mean, it's pretty common sense, but let me tell you, uh, the first threat that we had this year on September 24th where a student threatened to basically shoot our school. I don't want to go into details on that because there's, uh, there's you know, prosecution and, and whatnot. But um, with that, uh, you, would, you would be amazed at uh, how many people knew about that. I was shocked. As we sat down, we interviewed these kids. They knew exactly who it was. They knew exactly what he said. They all you know, have their own thoughts on whether he could do it or not. We'll not discuss that, but what I'm saying is what, what I found to be the most alarming is, I think uh, Mr. Petrov said, as of right now, 2018, in October, October, almost November, we've had 75 shootings at schools since January. And I was shocked to see that once I sat down and interviewed these kids, they knew about it and they still never said anything. Why? I think they're desensitized. I think society, social media has desensitized them. They all knew about it. Nobody felt the need to say anything until after I sat down and tried to talk reasonably with them and they said, oh yeah, you know, you're, you're probably right, you probably should have said something. So we say see something, say something, but that's what we're trying to get you as parents to do is have that dialogue with your kid. I encourage you in the evenings when you sit down with your family to eat, turn off your cell phones, have a conversation, just have a conversation with your child. That's where you're gonna learn about it. And maybe your child doesn't have the courage to come forward, but you, you are always able to come to us. My office is always open. I may or may not be there, but leave me a message. I will call you back, I promise you. Uh, so the threatening language, uh, language will not be tolerated in school. This includes talking about threats to school, uh, threats to shoot someone, hurt someone, uh, or any type of violence, uh, talking about guns, knives, bombs, hurting others, shooting, killing, etc., causing fear in others through words or actions. And that's what uh, Mr. Petrov talked about, is that have you caused fear to a group or made a group feel that they have been uh, threatened or uh, caused the district to respond so uh, recent unacceptable behaviors included, we had several of these. Uh, we've had four arrests since September 24th in regards to threats, three felonies and one misdemeanor. Um, threats written on bathroom walls, that was one of the common ones. Threats of bringing guns, knives, and weapons. Uh, and then threats of having hit lists. We've, those are things that we've seen, not necessarily all in our schools, but in the district. And so. You know, what we're trying to do is try to encourage you to go home, have that conversation with your kids. This, this is what you cannot say. You can't say these things. So we'll move to the next slide and then we'll get to the questions. So uh, how parents can help. Like I said, open up a conversation with your child. It includes the following components. A statement about the facts. Lately, several students have made threats. Some students have said, 
things to other students in class or on a bus. Others have written things on the bathroom walls or posted something on social media. I encourage you, please pay attention to your kids' social media. You know, we, we, we do monitor social media through Social Sentinel and other means. I won't tell you how we do that. I won't tell you the process because it's just not, no need, you know, there's not a, a need to know. Um, but a lot of the things that we do see do come through social media. There are parents that I know right now that say that their kids don't have social media. I promise you they do. There's also kids that think that Snapchat um, just goes away. It doesn't. Um, so tell your child uh, what words and phrases may uh, may not be used in school. You may not say some uh, say anything about shooting someone. You may not talk about guns, knives, bombs, hurting others, shooting or killing someone. Have a conversation about the consequences, and that being legal matters, legal action, being arrested, being charged with a misdemeanor or felony. Like I said, we've already had four of those this year. Jail time, suspension from school, and DAEP placements. And then we have CAP as well as, a repl as, a, as an alternative to DAEP. Um, so a uh, statement of parent expectations is as your parent, I expect you do not use these words. I expect that if you see or hear something, you say something to a trusted adult. If you have a concern regarding your child, please contact your child's principal or school counselor or myself, any of us. You know, we do not want to see something happen, happen at our school. 